Vyas Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Good evening, everyone. Okay, we are continuing now with the Alagadupama Sutta. This is Sutta number 22 in the Machimanikaya. And last time... I ended with the discussion of the section on the standpoints for views. The section begins on page 229 and it continues on to page 230. And at the very end of this section, the Buddha says that since he's speaking about the well-taught noble disciple, and he says that since this disciple regards all of these standpoints for views, regards them as this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself, Since he regards them thus, he is not agitated about what is non-existent externally. And here the Buddha uses this word, which is translated not agitated. The word translated agitated in Pali is paritasati which I explained last time. I won't repeat the full explanation, but it has two nuances in Pali. One is that of craving. In fact, probably the original significance is to crave. So paritasati, from paritasati when we get tas. Tasita, which is another name for tanha, tasina. But somehow that word got conflated with another word in Pali, Sanskrit, that family of languages, which has the meaning of to fear or fear. And so it also came on to take on the meaning of being afraid. And so the problem in translation is to find an English word or maybe several English words which can function, suggest the meaning of both craving and fear. I had taken agitation to be agitated. And so now when the Buddha makes the statement about not being agitated about what is non-existent, one monk who was listening to the discourse came up or stood up and asked the Buddha, first he asks whether there can be agitation about what is non-existent externally. You see, the Buddha used the expression he is not agitated about what is non-existent. Okay, so now this monk seems to be a clever monk. And so in his mind, he's thinking that there's a distinction between things that are external to oneself and things that pertain inwardly to oneself. So now he's going to ask two questions, we'll see about agitation relating to external things and then relating in internally. So first he asks about agitation in relation to what is 
non-existent externally. And so the Buddha says that there can be such agitation. And then he gives the case of somebody who thinks in this way. It might be a little difficult from the example to get the exact point, but I'll just first read the text and give the explanation. So someone thinks thus, Alas, I had it. Alas, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it. Alas, I do not get it. Okay, then he sorrows, grieves and laments. He weeps, beating his breast and becomes distraught. He goes, his mind becomes upset. He loses his mental balance. So that is how there is agitation about what is non-existent externally. Okay, the point of this non-existent externally. Okay, something that one had, some possession that one had, could be a material possession, could be a person that one had relationship with, but now one has it no longer. The material object has been destroyed, robbed, taken away, The person that one has been attached to, loved, has gone away, has passed away, and so one has it no longer. So that is, you call this the pain of loss, the suffering due to losing what one had, the cherished objects that have vanished from one's possession. Then the other side of this is, alas, may I have it, alas, I do not get it. This we can say is the suffering of not getting what one wants. One has a yearning for something. Again, it could be material possession, could be some kind of status, recognition, position, wealth. Or it could be some person, the love of a person. One wants it, but one does not get it. And then that brings us misery, sorrow, and mental distress. That's the word I was looking for, distress. So this is how there is agitation. We could even say anguish about what is non-existent externally. Things one had that one no longer has, things one wants that one does not get. Okay, then the monk asks, then can there be no agitation about what is non-existent externally? And then the Buddha answers, simply the case of somebody who does not think in such and such a way. And so this person, if he doesn't get things that he is not really yearning for, if he loses things to which he is not attached, if he doesn't get things for which he is not really yearning and itching to get, then he doesn't sorrow, grieve, and lament. He doesn't weep, beat his breast. Oh, how miserable I am, and become distraught. That is how there is no agitation about what is non-existent externally. So we actually have four possibilities developing here.
Okay, so now we come to the internal, the two possibilities relating to the internal. Okay, somebody has the view. This is the very strong eternalist view. A deep attachment to this view of the self. It's a rather strange view, the way it's stated here. I mentioned last time that it seems a little bit like an Upanishadic view. Though I did a little homework after the last class. We've, I found a book in the library, a very seems to be quite an excellent book called The Wisdom of the Upanishads. <laughs> and this view doesn't really seem to be exactly like the Upanishadic view, which is not simply that the self is the world, but that there is some kind of abiding spiritual reality behind the world, the ultimate source of the world, which is called Brahman. And the teaching of the Upanishads is that the ultimate nature of oneself is the Atman. The ultimate nature of the world is Brahman. And the Atman and the Brahman are identical. But that seems somewhat different from saying simply that that which is the self is the world. But it seems almost as if that view from the Upanishads might have gotten circulated and calmed down by the time it reached the part of India where the Buddha was teaching. It had gotten, appeared in a somewhat, or presented in a somewhat distorted form. So the way the Buddhist text present it, that which is the self is the world. In any way, it's asserting the eternal identity of a self. After death, I shall be, or I shall, ex better to say, after death, I shall exist permanently, forever, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. So here somebody has a strong identification with a sense of self and wants to go on existing as a self forever into eternity. Then he hears the Tathagata, that's the Buddha, or a disciple of the Tathagata, teaching the Dhamma. And here the translation doesn't quite measure up to the original. Because the original comes out quite nicely. We have three words with different words, compounds with tana in it. Tana means something like station or stand. You would see it in the Sanskrit, stana. Stana, stand. Basically, they're coming from the same verbal root. So, the Tathagata, Tathagata is teaching Dhamma for the elimination of all dittitana. That would be standpoints for views. I think it was a fault of the editor to leave out the word for views. So it's the elimination of all standpoints for views. Then decisions was not a good decision to use that word. <laughs> the word is aditana, which is something like taking a stand, making a stand, it would be making a stand, taking up a standpoint based on the idea of self. And then comes pariyutana, 
which is what's translated as obsession, but in the word pariyutana, one has again this one of the word, part, words in that compound is tana. Pariyutana means things which rise up and obsess the mind. And then come adherences, abhinivesa, that is clinging to things through craving and wrong views, taking things to be mine and I. And then for the elimination of all underlying tendencies, these are the underlying tendencies to I-making, my-making, and conceit. The conceit I am. Okay, then comes a fixed formula for the stilling or quieting down of all formations. This would be all kinds of karmic activities, karmically creative activities. For the relinquishing of all attachments, sabupadi patini sago. That means giving up all upadi means the better translation for upadi would be assets. <laughs> like people speak about their assets. What are your assets? I have a house, bank account, stocks. Um, trust funds, um, okay, then asking more pointed questions, some of your other assets, I have my wife, my children, <laughs> what are your other assets? I don't know. Then, <laughs> The Buddhist text would say, your other assets, form, bodily form, <laughs> feeling, <laughs> perception, volitional formations, consciousness, those are your assets. And the attachment to all of those as being I and mine, that has to be relinquished. For the destruction of craving, tanhakaya. For dispassion, viraga, the fading away of lust. For cessation, niroda, the cessation of craving, the cessation of becoming. For nibbana, which originally means extinguishing the going out of the fire. Okay, so now because he has this attachment to this view of self, when he hears this, he thinks, so I will be annihilated. I will perish. I will be no more. Because now his eternal, eternalist view has been challenged. He finds that there's no more self for him to cling to. No going on forever into eternity. <laughs> if he wants to, of course, he can just go on taking rebirth and going on and on from one life to another. <laughs>
but that's just a selfless process going on, taking the risks of going down into the lower worlds, maybe enjoying sometimes life in heaven, but then having to pass away from that world into the lower worlds. But that's not the kind of perfect eternity that he wants to enjoy. And so now he feels that his self has been threatened, taken away from him, and that his ultimate destiny is annihilation. And so he becomes sorrowful, he grieves, laments, weeps, beats his breast, and becomes distraught. Okay, so this this is how that is how there is agitation about what is non existent internally. Okay, so now the other side of this is how there is no agitation about what is non existent internally. And this is somebody who does not have this attachment to the eternalist view. Presumably this would be somebody who is maybe by temperament disposed to renunciation, to detachment. Apparently it's somebody who is not already a disciple of the Buddha, Otherwise, he would already be familiar with this teaching. But somebody who is seeking some true path to liberation from suffering. And so he hears the Buddha or disciple of the Buddha teach the Dhamma for all of these purposes. And he doesn't think, I shall be annihilated, I shall perish, I shall be no more. And therefore he doesn't sorrow, grieve and lament. He does not weep, beating his breast and become distraught. So that is how there is no agitation about what is non-existent internally. Okay, maybe at this point I'll just ask If there's anybody who has questions about anything here that needs to be cleared up. Um, Back in the first first pair about external. Yeah. Can you clarify what is meant by external things that are non-existent? It really means... To say, oh, you know, I I want this car and I didn't get this car. Well, the car obviously exists, so that's what you yeah, it's not literally things that don't exist at all. In the case of something that one, maybe in the first example, it is something which has become non-existent, something that one had, then it's something that's perished, or that's, well, if it's something that's perished, then it's truly non-existent. If it's something that say, a person that has slipped away from one, (laughs) that one no longer has in one's grasp, then you could say, alas, I had it, but now I have it no longer. It still exists, or that person still exists. But in the sense of having a relationship with oneself, one could say it doesn't exist. In the case of the car that one doesn't get, of course, the car still exists but in the sense of it not being your possession, in that sense we should understand it doesn't exist. So I think one has to interpret this expression non-existent contextually, not take it too literally. Um, The thought that it occurred to me hearing hearing non-existent was that it's not just that I want a car, let's say, but that I want a car that will never decay. I want a relationship that will never fade or turn sour. Um, I want something that's non-existent. 
I'm not sure that we have. Because in the next section, it talks about permanent unchanging in regards to the interim. Um, actually, you might have a very good point there, because paragraph 22, which we're going to come to, goes along with your idea. I don't know whether that's necessarily implied by paragraph 18. It seems to put more into it than is actually stated by the words of paragraph 18. But paragraph 22 does bring out the idea of the impossibility of having a permanent possession. So it's a, a good observation. I'll make that for the recording. <laughs> which doesn't pick up your voice. He said that by what is non-existent externally, one might understand a desirable possession which will be permanent and unchanging. Okay, any other question pertaining to these sections? Anything that just needs clarification? Yes. Does the same... Um line of questioning apply also to internal non-existences? In other words, a permanent self versus a changing, never changing? The way the word self is used within Indian thought and the way the Buddha uses it Self would imply the idea of permanence. So if there is, to say that something is self and impermanent would virtually be a contradiction in terms. So one would have a personality, an individual identity, but that individual identity is something that consists in the com composition of these five aggregates which are always changing. In that sense, we could say that there's a relative empirical selfhood. And so we could use the word self in that sense in a conventional sense as being something conditioned, composite, just as a conventional expression. But when the Buddha picks up this word self as an object or a topic of philosophical examination, then what is always lying in the background is the idea for the self to be something that could stand up under examination. It should be something that is permanent. Though there were thinkers in this period, some who had the idea of a personality or a kind of self which gets cut off at death and is annihilated. Those were the thinkers who were called the annihilationists. They believed in a kind of temporary self. I'm trying to think whether they, whether they actually used the word Atman for that. Well, I think they didn't use the word Atman, self, but they just spoke about an existing being that is cut off and annihilated at death and doesn't exist after death. Yes. The distinction between external and internal implies duality? It implies that there is a distinction, yeah, between things that are external to oneself and what is referred to as the self internal, the internal self. Internally, yeah. In fact, the, the word, <laughs> the word that is translated as internal in Pali, actually has self as one of its components, it's ajatka. Which is adi plus atta. The word atta is the word that means self. Adi has various uses, it's just a prefix. In this case, it might be taken to mean something like, to have a kind of reflexive sense, meaning 
referring back upon oneself. And so here we have the word self, but it's being used in this conventional sense. It doesn't mean (laughs) that it's establishing the existence of the self in the sense of that what I would call a truly existent core of individual identity, of personal identity. That is what the Buddha is examines critically and rejects. Okay, let us proceed. Unless does somebody else have some question of a point that needs clarification? Okay. Expecting an awful question, but um, is there anything in samsara which we experience that we will also experience after we have attained nirvana? I only want to ask for questions that are clarifications of the text that I'm discussing. That question goes off into a different, completely different area. Okay. Okay. Impermanence and not self. Paragraph 22. Okay, now the Buddha is going to be, in a sense, drawing out certain conclusions from this discussion of agitation. But you'll see he develops, he doesn't actually pull out the conclusions himself, but he develops these conclusions rhetorically, that is by asking the monks questions and getting them, let's say he almost pulls out the conclusions Socratically, the way Socrates (laughs) might, (laughs) by getting the monks to give the answers. Though in a sense he's almost putting words in their mouth. (laughs) He says, Bhikkhus, you may well acquire that possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. So he's saying, if there is something which is permanent and unchanging, go ahead, go for it. Take possession of it. Go right ahead. No restraint, no regul, no regulations. Go for it. But <laughs> do you see any in the Pali? He doesn't abbreviate, but he says, he says Do you see, O oh monks, any possession? that you could acquire, that would be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. And then the monks say, no, venerable sir. And then the Buddha says, good monks, I too do not see any possession that is permanent, everlasting, and so on. Okay, so this paragraph as I indicated earlier, is seems to be referring back to paragraph 18. And it's, in a sense, I would say that this paragraph is intended as a, the antidote to craving. We have these two problems, equalities, like almost like the two spikes or two prongs of the fork of ignorance, two ways ignorance manifests. One is through craving, the other is through wrong views. And the chief of the wrong views 
the most the sort of radical wrong view is the wrong view of self. Okay, and if you remember how the discourse started, it started with the pernicious view or the evil view, papaka ditti gattang, of the monk Arita, who had the view that those things that are caused, called obstructions by the Buddha don't really obstruct one who indulges in them. And he said that in regard to the enjoyment of sensual pleasures. I looked in the Chinese version of the sutta and the Chinese version is more explicit in bringing out the fact that his view was that it is the indulgence and sensual pleasures that... But what he was saying is that one could indulge in sensual pleasures without incurring any fault, that that was his view. And so that was a view which is in a sense... It's a view, but it's a view on the side of craving. But the Buddha deals partly with that view on the side of craving by reproaching this monk, Arita. But then he picks up the other type of view, which is the view of self, and takes that for examination. So we have these two say these two threads running through this discourse, the call this the setting up a dam to protect the teaching against the overflow of craving as expressed in the view of the monk Arita, and also setting up another dam to protect it from the flood of the view of self. So this section on possessions, we could say, is directed against this spike of craving. Now we come to the other side, the side of views, and particularly picking up the view of self. The Buddha says, He says, you may well take up or cling to that doctrine of self that would not bring sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. Okay, so now the Buddha is giving an invitation to the monks, take up a view of self. Go right ahead and adopt any view of self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. And the wording here, it's interesting, since it might give rise to the question, could one actually take up a view of self without clinging to it? And it would seem the way (laughs) the Buddha or the Buddha's texts understand the idea of a doctrine of self in adopting a view of self there would always be some kind of clinging, underlying a doctrine of self. That the reason why one would pick up and adopt a doctrine of self is because of some clinging. But one can make use of concepts of self and use, one could Let's say one could adopt concepts of self and use them skillfully without clinging to them. But in that case, one is not really adopting a view of self in the sense of Atavadupadana. Just the 
Yeah, actually what the polytext is saying, you might well cling to that clinging to a doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. So what one would be, what is at fault is picking up with clinging a doctrine of self. Now one might pick up or adopt concepts of self, use vocabulary of self skillfully without clinging to this type of language. In that case, one doesn't really have a view of self in the sense of like a philosophical view that identifies this is myself. But one just uses the expression self, the words, the vocabulary of self skillfully for those who are at certain levels of understanding. For example, the Buddha says that you are responsible for your own deeds. But in Pali it comes out something like atahi atano nato. You are your own. Self is the protector of self. That's what it comes out to in Pali. Some interpreters of this, especially Vedantic interpreters and those with who have been influenced by Vedantic ways of thinking, like to choose these verses and say, see, this verse from the Dhammapada shows that the Buddha really held a view of self. <laughs> and so all of the teachings on non-self, that those have to be understood to mean that the Buddha was rejecting what is not to self, what is not the self in order to point to the glorious true self. But that's not the case. He's just using these expressions of ordinary common speech in order to convey a point, an ethical point in terms of training. Or you must, again, verses that come in the Dhammapada, you must purify yourself, you must train yourself. In Pali, it's always it's the word atta, atta, atanam, the same word for self the Buddha is using. But in one sutta, we had this in the Dhamma discussion on Saturday, it's the Potapada Sutta and the Diga Nikaya, Diga Nikaya Sutta number nine, the Buddha says, these are just terms, the Buddha has been using an expression, Attapati Laba, which means the acquiring of self. That's a term that was used in that period to mean taking a particular form of rebirth. It's called gaining a self, picking up a self. And so the Buddha used this term also to explain the nature of the person, how the person changes states from one existence to another. But the Buddha says, these are just terms, concepts, conventions used in the world, worldly terms of speech, that the Tathagata makes use of without clinging to them. Okay, then we move on to paragraph 24. Now the Buddha speaks more broadly. He says, you may well take as a support, actually translating the Pali very literally would be, you may well support yourself with that support of views. 
that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. Again, he says, do you see any such support? The monks say no. And so then the Buddha says, I too do not see any support of views. So these two paragraphs are interesting that the Buddha says, clinging to any doctrine of self eventually leads to sorrow, pain, grief, and despair. Maybe not immediately, but one has some clinging to a view of self, and in some way it will, maybe not in this life, but <laughs> because people go on believing in self and soul blissfully right up to the time of their death. But at some point, I guess, it will bring sorrow <laughs> and grief. And the same with any views that are taken as a support that one sort of depends upon or clings to, which doesn't mean that one doesn't have a view about certain issues. According to the Buddha, in following the Noble Eightfold Path, one uses a view which is the right view, but right view properly taken up. Of course, we can also say it's a support, it's a support for following the Noble Eightfold Path. But here the word nisthaya would have the suggested nuances of something that one is resting upon again with craving and clinging. <laughs> okay, then paragraph 25 and this is a somewhat interesting beginning. Okay, now the Buddha takes we had this duality of internal and external then possessions and self possessions and doctrine of self now we have that same duality treat or dyad pair treated in a somewhat different way in terms of the pair self and what belongs to self. In Pali it is atta and ataniya. Okay, so first the Buddha says, and here this is locative absolute. <laughs> You can't escape it, even from sut in a sutta class. There being a self, atani va bhikave sati. Then the question: Would there be for me what belongs to a self, ataniyang meiti asati? So, if a self exists, then there would be things that belong to a self, self's possessions. Okay, then we could approach this relationship in another way, but again with an inescapable locket of absolute. Atani yeva bhikave sati. Or there being what belongs to a self. Atta meti asati. Would there be for me a self? Okay, so self and what belongs to a self. The two are indissoluble inseparably locked together. 
if one or the other exists. And now this next sentence is quite interesting and important. And again, it's a locative absolute. Atani cha bhikave, atani ye cha satchato tetato anupalabha mane yampi dang ditti tanang, etc., etc., Because since a self and what belongs to a self are not apprehended or are not found as true and established or as true and solid, then this standpoint for views, namely that which is the self is the world, after death I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. Would it not be an utterly and completely foolish teaching? And then the monks say, what else could it be, Venerable Sir, but an utterly and completely foolish teaching? Now what makes this paragraph particularly interesting Okay, the Buddha developed this mutual, he calls this, this mutual, mutually implicating relationship between self and what belongs to a self. Now he doesn't say, since a self and what belongs to a self are not existent, then the standpoint for views, etc., etc., would it not be a completely and utterly foolish teaching? But he says, since the self and what belongs to a self are not apprehended, are not found, are not discovered as true and established, it makes an important difference. So he's not like setting up, you might call it an ontological standpoint, and saying, a self and what belongs to a self are non-existent. But he's saying that they're not discovered as true and established. Which is like saying, look for them. See if you can find them. And to find them as being a true self and what truly belongs to self, they have to be apprehended such a to as something true something established that could stand up under examination. But since they're not found when we undertake this examination, no matter what one looks at, one never finds this self and Therefore, one never finds anything belonging to self, then the view of any kind of permanent, everlasting self becomes something which is a foolish teaching. Okay, and now, in what follows, which I'll try to go through, maybe I... Should I stop here or go through this very quickly? I think we've gone through it before. So, have we gone through this before in this class? No? <laughs> okay, maybe we leave it for next time. Okay, then let's see what time it is. Yeah, I think we'll... It's too much to try to fit in. Okay, now I'll ask if there's any questions on anything covered tonight. Okay. Well, I wonder about uh, paragraph uh, 23, the doctrine of self and the battle of sorrow lamentation. Yeah. 
a considerable portion of the world's population believes in a soul. Yeah. And in eternal soul. Yeah. And, you know, and I can't say that it necessarily involves sorrow and the... <laughs> <laughs> I said that too. In my lecture, I said that many people believe in the self, the soul, and they live quite happily, blissfully, right up to the time of their death. So, if one just takes the perspective <laughs> of one lifetime, then it doesn't necessarily lead to sorrow, <laughs> lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. So, maybe the sense is the way I would make sense out of it is that holding to the view of self is one of the fetters. Is it a fetter? Technically a fetter. Sakaya Ditti. Well, yeah, it's one of the fetters or one of the bonds that keeps one tied to samsara. And so, since it keeps one tied to samsara, as one wanders through samsara, one comes across, again, one undergoes sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And sort of an underlying root cause of that is the clinging to a doctrine of self. That's the only way I can make sense out of that. But I have to agree with you that many people believe in a doctrine of self of some form, belief in a soul, and it gives them consolation. Um, for many who want to take some kind of spiritual discipline, it will give a deep inner happiness. For some meditators, say in yogic and Hindu traditions, the idea of soul can lead to soup states of superconsciousness blissful states of consciousness. And so I can't say that it will lead to sorrow, grief, despair within this life itself. So I'd have to agree with that criticism, <laughs> with your comment. Okay. Yes, Father, in um, Sutta 13, we mentioned the Vedanta teachings and uh, their view of a uh, everlasting and supreme self. Yeah. Um, I kind of find this may sound strange, but I kind of find that, uh, in the, and I understand the Buddhist doctrine of non-self, being that as far as you investigate it, you can never find something that is solid in itself. Well, <coughs> in Vedanta, from what I've uh, studied, the supreme self is described as infinite, encompasses all but yet it's infinite mm. so it seems to me that only the words themselves mm. really are really what, what are different the words describing non-self as non-self and self as self mm. well, I, yeah, you know. okay let me just for the recorder he says that in the Vedanta they say that the Supreme Self is something which is infinite, all-encompassing, so it's not to be identified with the finite individual self. And so there seems to be, if you go beyond the word, something which is identical or almost identical with the Buddhist teaching of anatta. Is that what you... Something, something, or something quite similar. Um, I have to say that there's truly that there's a definite difference in standpoint between the Vedantic approach and the Buddhist approach. I can't pass judgment to say where they're ultimately ending up. Um, and in my just reviewing the teachings of the Upanishads last week and looking at that book, I have to say, I couldn't agree if this statement is taken to be referring to Upanishads, that an utterly and completely foolish teaching. What I could see is that if it weren't for the Buddha's teaching on anatta, 
that the Upanishadic view seems to be a very, very high spiritual view, a very deep, very high spiritual view. But there's... I'd have to say, (laughs) still, the way I would see it, a very subtle clinging (laughs) to the idea of an I and the self there, which... It seems almost like the subtlest, the most refined, the purest sublimation of the idea of self. Till there's only like one little thread holding that idea in place. And that is the idea of I am. (laughs) And then the Buddha came on the Indian scene and knocked out the idea of I am. (laughs) And that in a sense... One could say that it sort of opened up the Upanishadic view of self to its ultimate possibility, which would be the complete liberation. (laughs) Okay, any further questions? Okay, then we will close for tonight, ending with the sharing of the merits. Okay, we share the merit with the devas, the spirits, the nagas, that's the long, and all other beings, wishing them to be well, happy, wishing them to protect this world and to protect the beings in the world. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu desanang Akasa ta chabu mata deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu mang parang etavata cha am hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe deva anumodantu sabasampati sedia Etavata cha am hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe bhuta numodantu sabha sampati siddhya etavata cha am hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe sata anumodantu sabha sampati siddhya Oh.